but at least I can talk loud so that um, you can hear over, Whoa! maybe you can't understand any of it. <clears throat> Open Source for America is a group that we started in the United States to promote the use of open source in the government. This is a good time to do it because now that George Bush has left office and Barack Obama came into office, the environment for open source is much better in the United States than it was in the previous eight years before. So the focus now is more on transparency and openness as opposed to large organizations that make a lot of money and control parts of the market. It was founded in July 2009. We, have, we had 1,200 members sign up in the first month for the, on the site. It's all volunteers <clears throat> and the uh, membership ranges from people who are programmers to city council members of small towns to um, teachers, all sorts, of, all sorts of people have joined the organization. It's not only for technical people, not only for programmers. The initial group of companies that partnered in creating Open Source for America includes a lot of large companies you'll recognize like Google and O'Reilly and Oracle, Canonical, but also um, open source organizations like Debian, Open Source Initiative. There's a lot of people, a lot of organizations involved because, <clears throat> like I said, this, it's the use of open source in the government is an important idea and people recognize that. They want to get involved. So the mission of the organization is to educate people who work in the government about the advantages of using free software and to try to get the government to give an equal chance. To, to, get, to get people to give to get the government to give open source solutions an equal chance with private solutions because a lot of the rules and the laws in the government make it complicated and maybe even illegal to use a solution that's not provided by a private company because since no single particular group may be providing the solution with open source, it can be complicated for the government to use it because they have to hold someone accountable for the solution. So we want to educate people who work for the government that there are companies who will provide support and can be held accountable for open source solutions and they should be given an equal chance with a proprietary product. And also one of the, one of the things that we're trying to do is give the government someone they can go to to ask questions about open source and that all the companies that can all the companies that produce open source like Red Hat and Zimbra can share information with the government in a uniform way that makes sense to provide information so the activities are mainly about providing a place where people can go to get this information and get involved and provide like a clear leadership, like a place for people to go to. And also we will, we have organizations like Red Hat and Google have um, lobbying, which I don't know what the word would be in, in Portuguese, but companies in America spend money to influence the government. So big companies like Red Hat and Google that have a lot of money are doing what normally companies like IBM would have done for proprietary software, although IBM does a lot of open source, that they are lobbying the government to use open source software. So this can go both ways. Like you think of corporate, big corporations as you know, only lobbying for their self-interest, but in the case of Red Hat and Google, it's in their self-interest for the government to use open source software. We're also organizing events in the United States to get people to come together to talk about using 
open source in their, in their local city and state governments. I think everybody knows here probably what open source is, right? Uh, free software. Okay, I would think so. So these next slides just kind of explain free software, so I'm going to jump through them. But I mean mainly that you can, it's free to use for any purpose and you can study it and all the stuff that we like about open source. So in 2004, the government actually issued a memorandum, like an official memorandum, calling on agencies to give open source solutions an equal analysis to proprietary solutions. That is, the agencies as part of their due diligence, in, in other words, the, the things that they have to do, the steps that they have to go through when they go out to buy a solution, they are required to try to look for open source solutions and see what the open source community provides. And open source is used now by, there's, there is a lot of open source being used in the American government. Brazil started probably more before the American government did and uses a lot of open source. But America has started doing it and is catching up, you know, trying to catch up. One of the big early adopters was the, the Veterans Administration, which this is the the Army, the U.S. Army has hospitals all over the United States for treating soldiers who come back from wars. And they, they estimated that one in five lab tests, when they would run a test like a blood test on a soldier, that soldier might move to another city. And that same test, the records of that test would not be available in that city, so they'd run the test again. And they estimated that one in five of these tests had already been run somewhere else. And these tests are expensive. Medical tests are expensive. So the Veterans Administration built a piece of open source software to integrate all the records keeping facilities in all of these government hospitals and exchange data with each other. And that made it very cheap for them to implement that. So the cost of maintaining that system they estimate is $87 per user, per person that's in the system. And that the cost of just one lab test that gets administered twice is $80. So if, if it saves even one lab test per patient, the system has already paid for itself. But anybody who's been to the doctor knows that they run a lot more than one lab test. And that over time, the system more than pays for itself, it saves a lot of money. Um, and some of these other statistics, like it, it cut pneumonia hospitalizations in half and reduced the costs by $40 million, saving 6,000 lives, which is one of the interesting things about cost savings in a medical system. If you can save money putting out a, a better medical system, a better record-keeping system, you don't just save money, you save a lot of people's lives. So using open source can actually save people's lives, not just save money. Another major user is the Federal Aviation Administration who runs the systems that control all the airplanes in the United States. It's a standardized system. And when they came, the system was aging, they, they put open source up as a possible solution for it and that ended up winning the contract and the cost of replacing each of the computers in the FAA system with open source dropped from $25,000 per system to $3,000 per system. They reported a tenfold increase of reporting capacity. In other words, the speed of the new open source systems was 30 times faster than the proprietary software it replaced. And they cut their IT costs by 50%, saving $15 million. So that's a major, major deployment of open source. In the, in the US. The Connect Portal is another new, interesting medical system that with the success of the veterans hospitals, they identified that beyond just exchanging health records between the VA hospitals, that if they could exchange medical records between the social security, the small clinics and small hospitals, a lot of soldiers may live in a small town where you know, there is no 
there is no army hospital, the nearest army hospital may be a long way away. If they can still integrate these clinics and hospitals, then those cost savings of not repeating a lab test can be achieved like all over the United States. So they built, and this, what's interesting about this that I think somebody in Brazil should look at is this is a piece of open source software that the US government is writing and making available that you put this piece of software on top of your hospital's patient information system and then the hospitals can exchange health records with each other to save money on these lab tests and so on that were discussed. So this is software that you could download in Brazil and apply to hospitals in Brazil and not have to pay anybody a license fee. So it's even, you know, could be a business for somebody in Brazil to do that, a big business. Um, <clears throat> there's more than 20 federal organizations beyond just Social Security and the VA. There's 20 parts of the government that are all involved in this exchange of information between medical organizations, including like this, the Center for Disease Control and, you know, the other, like the, um, well, I think the, the Red Cross may be involved in it. Just all the organizations that need to exchange medical information with each other and right now basically might do it by paper or email. Brian Bellendorf, whose name you might know as the creator of the Apache Project, is who the government brought in to oversee the open source element of this project to make sure that the project was managed well, managed like a good open source project. So that's, that's pretty thoughtful on the, on the government's part, on the United States government's part, because Apache is next to Linux probably the most successful open source program just about in existence. Um, another interesting thing is that the U.S. Navy has deployed an open source system for controlling battleships, like all the, the newer battleships, the integrated ship control system, which links the navigation and the engines and the weapon systems, everything on the ship is controlled by open source, the, the, you know, everything on a giant Navy destroyer. So this, this replaced proprietary systems where, like as an example, the Navy has a, a fleet of minesweepers that look for uh, m mines in the oceans, like explosives in the oceans. And they were running a 1970s, late 1970s piece of software that the vendor wouldn't give the, the source to the government. And if there's a bug in the software, the government couldn't get it fixed. And this isn't your home computer, this is a minesweeper, you know, that's going through the ocean looking for explosives. Like, you really don't want to be a sailor on a ship that has a bug in it that's looking for explosives in the ocean because it could blow up. So the, um, the new system that the Navy has deployed saves millions of dollars of cost. Again, allows them to reuse that system on a variety of Navy ships without paying license fees for all of these different use cases. So it provides a lot of cost savings and flexibility, operational flexibility for the Navy. So you should become a member of Open Source for America, even though you're in Brazil, because like, like we said, this is open source software. You can download it and see if it would apply to your government. Or also read about what's going on, the way we're approaching our government. I'm sure there's things that you're doing that we'd like to know about. Like there may be an open source for Brazil. I know Fisle, but we, we want to learn about what Brazil is doing and how Brazil is achieving so much success getting open source into the government. But not all of us can read Portuguese, so if you come and tell us, like, you should read this web page and get somebody to translate it to English, we'll do that. But if we don't know where to look, we might not find it. So join up and, and get involved in the discussion because the United States does a lot of stuff and if we, you know, if, if we produce open source that's valuable for our government, chances are to be valuable for yours, and there are probably things you have that we need that we should find out about. So you can go to the site to sign up. Um, that's the end of my presentation, but I was gonna maybe pull up the website if you wanted to see the website.
How am I doing on time? I got probably lots of time, huh? Or questions if people would prefer to ask questions. Oh, I got like 40 minutes left. Actually, I'm gonna show videos. I might play with a blender. I got a lot of time. This website actually, oh, you got a question, great. Uh, people uh, from some companies say that open source software can be more expensive, make more expensive to maintain than uh, proprietary software. Do you think this, this, those, these thoughts is correct? I, I think that's kind of a trick, kind of a tricky way to deal with things because there are, bad, there are bad pieces of open source software, just like there are bad pieces of proprietary software. And I don't mean bad as in evil, I mean just bad as in poorly written. So you could have a proprietary system that sucks and is expensive to maintain because it's not written well and it crashes and it's not obvious how to configure it. You see this in, in open source. I mean, some things like, you know, um, I guess it's K3B, the, the disk burning software for KDE is incredibly easy to use. You really don't need a manual hardly. You turn it on, you run it, and you, it's like put a CD in, burn it, anybody could run it. But then there are other pieces of open source software like VI. Some people might say that's a bad text editor. It's certainly hard to learn. But of course there are advantages to it as well. I think that's where the key is. It's about exchanging information. like. The reason, that, the reason that it looks probably like proprietary software is more efficient is because it's been around longer and there's more established like magazines and consultancies and the business processes of finding the most effective software are more well developed. But as that expertise develops in the free software community, I think that, I think free software can be every bit as efficient and cheaper I mean, it's just obvious on some level when you look at it that if your company has bought a lot of some piece of proprietary software and then you decide you have to change and you have to go buy another completely different piece of software and replace all those licenses, it's just obvious that that's going to cost a lot of money. So the key is you've got to reduce the amount of human time it takes to maintain that system. Like, you know, um, I don't know if you, you know TiVo. Like, TiVo runs Linux. Nobody ever spent six hours trying to configure their X server on TiVo, right? It runs Linux, you turn it on, it just works. But if you get in and you hack with it, it, it you can make a real mess of your Linux box to where it takes you a long time to do anything with it. So I think for businesses to use open source effectively, they need to make a lot more rules about how they deploy it control it and make it so that it's more like a TiVo. You turn it on and you use it. Hi. Just a, a simple question about the confidentiality of the information. We here have different minds from US in the mindset of it's open source, it's a devil for your humankind. But uh, we know that open source software is not the open source information. So how do you manage the confidentiality of the information, especially on medical records, for instance? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, open source by no means means that the system lets you do whatever you want. Um, you know, Connect has cryptography, obviously that any record being requested has to have a, a cryptographic signature from the requester to identify them as someone that would have the permission to, to request that record. And that's part of something that's still being worked out. With the Army hospitals, it's a little easier because soldiers, or it's a little different than when you have norm, normal citizens, but 
you know, the, the interfaces for people to be able to identify themselves securely are still being worked out, honestly, because there's just not a great solution for that, even in the commercial world right now, as far as, like, for you to, for instance, be able to vote at home for a politician. Like, there's not really a way to know, to know for sure that this is you as opposed to somebody who's stolen your identity. So, I mean, it's subject to those same kinds of dangers, and it, it does increase that danger because if the information is all on paper locked up in a file cabinet, then obviously it's harder for the information to get shared. But, I mean, you still have the same basic problem. Somebody could call up and say, oh, this is Dr. Smith, you know, I, and it could be a reporter who's trying to, you know, write a story on how your health is bad and your business will be in trouble or something like that. that Arguably, you know, I think at least with a digital system, paper in a drawer, paper sitting in a file cabinet, there's really nothing other than the person who's operating that file cabinet to keep it safe from being, you know, from being sold or, you know, you have a lot of different, at least you can't bribe a computer, you know, is easy. Like, is it, so I think, I think it can increase security. I think there are definitely, I will, there are definitely issues with how that needs to be handled. That's exactly the kind of thing where I think, you know, I don't know what the, what the part of the Brazilian government that manages the health system is, but I think it would be great if they downloaded this software since they can, they can do that and look at it and say like, have you guys thought about this? Like, because I think you're well ahead actually, because I think you're, your hospital system is open source as well, I think. So, and it's been deployed for several years. So I, I would be very interested to learn about anything going on in that area so we could tell people about it. Any other questions? Uh, uh, I'm not the de developer, but uh, I, do, I do research about uh, information system in healthcare. And a few years ago, I read about uh, Vista, uh, but they, they are talking a lot about this since Obama. Uh, and I didn't know about uh, Connect Portal. Uh, uh, what I want to know is uh, Vista and Connect Portal, how are they being developed in, in modular form? You know, in, in models uh, that you can ad adapt to different kind of uh, uh, health systems because they work differently, the, the management and some, some laws. Uh, do you know about that? I only have a limited um, amount of knowledge about that, but that's where I do want to show you, like, um, let's see here. Let me just, uh, I'm going to pull up the website real quick. There is specifically a, um, a healthcare discussion list on Open Source for America, and if you ask on there, I know that some of the guys from Mirth and some of the other organizations that are doing um, work in that area are on that list, so if you ask a question like that, I, I don't even know, I'm not a, I don't specialize in medical systems, but the, uh, but I know that there are a lot of like established protocols. I know one of the things Connect is trying to do is it's like an adapter that you can put Connect on top of its various older systems, and then, you know, once, if you have Connect on this system and Connect on this system, even though those two systems might not talk directly to each other, like Connect can talk to this system and Connect can talk to this system and then Connect can talk to each other. So it's like a, it's a healthcare information adapter essentially is what it is. Do they connect to uh, closed systems with uh, open APIs or something? So, so I believe you could have two systems using Connect that talk to each other and no government agency would have access to that by virtue of it. It's, you know, it's a software standard, not necessarily a single system that you have to connect to. It's a, it's a piece of open source software you can install on, on your system. Um, my question... Uh 
that's, that's very simple. Um, how can developers make money making that software uh, in the United States? How many of you have a friend who's a lawyer? A lawyer, you know lawyers? So if you think about it, law is a lot like computer software. It's, you know, it's a structured document that, and if you, here's a really funny thing. Have you ever heard of a contract that you couldn't copy and change? Now this is really strange if you think about it. The lawyers all like write these laws that don't let you copy and change software, but you never hear of a lawyer patenting the way a contract is written, saying, oh, you can't write that kind of contract. I, I patented it, right? So law is essentially like a structured system, a structured open source system, like the Constitution is a collaborative document written by a lot of authors that defines a structure which is essentially what code does, what programs do. So lawyers make a lot of money. You know, they don't charge you a license for the contract, they charge you for your time. So the way you make money as a programmer is number one, you've got to understand money. You've got to definitely understand how money works and how money is made, which a lot of programmers don't. And that's, that's, that's not to their benefit to not understand that because money is a structured system like code. So. You just have to, you charge for your time. Or you invent something as some service that you write a program to do. You know, you, you utilize free software in that service. You don't have to give everything away as free software. You know, I think that's one of the good things about the, I, I like Apache more than GPL because I think Apache is more about like, if somebody else out there wants to do what you already did and they've got the time and energy to do it, then you don't have a business because somebody could duplicate what you're doing. But if you make a program and it does something special and you used open source in it and you want to hold it for a while and then maybe you give it away, those, those are all things you're free to do. You know, I think that's what it's really about is what you're free to do. And you're definitely free to charge someone for your time and say, if you want to have three hours of my time, that's going to cost you 300 hail or you know, whatever. And then you just got to stay busy. You know, and then you can make a, a good living. One more question. The key element to the turning point to a uh, open source governance model, let's say like that, is how do you make money, uh, despite the donation of course, but how do you are making money to invest in new projects and to to, to make the things run smoothly. You mean as, a, as the government or as a business? As a business. Well, like I said, I mean, like there are law firms and consultancies that, there are law firms that do nothing except charge for people's time working on legal documents that make billions of dollars a year, you know, and so, you can take a piece of open source software, make some contributions to it, but mostly spend your time finding businesses that need that software, that don't want to learn everything about it, and charge them a fair fee to, to implement it. You know, a lot of the time, the price of software is actually modeled more on what it does for you. Like, if somebody, let's say, has an inefficient sales system, inefficient inventory system, where maybe they, they have inventory in another store, and they can't see that, and people come in and say, I wanna buy this, and they're like, oh, we're out. Right? If you come in and you say, hey, I can build you a system that will connect that, so you, you'll know if you have stock over there and you can sell it to your customers, they might double the amount of money they make in a year. And if you come in and say, like, I'll do this for you, and I want 20% of the m extra money I'm gonna make you. You know, that it really becomes less about selling software and more about selling what software can do. And I think that if programmers can start to think that way, instead of thinking purely in like, I'm selling a little box, it's like you're selling your skill and your intelligence. And that can be, you, you don't even have to put an hourly price on that. You can sell it based on, you know, like if, if you come to somebody and you're like, hey, you got $100, I'll show you how you could have $500 and you just have to give me 100 of it. You know, and if it's all legal, then that's a great way for everybody involved to make money. If 
that makes sense. Anybody else have a question? Because I think I got lots of time. <laughs> I still don't really get how, suppose you did a program like Tivo, like you put, run it and it works right there and you put it open source in your, in your website. How can you sell it to someone if they can just simply download it? Yeah, because that's the thing is you're, you're thinking in terms of selling the program, not selling your service. So you don't want to spend all of your energy making an, that's the, that's the big difference between, you know, proprietary software and open source software. For open source software, we have to work, you, we have to work as a community because if one person, if they do all the work, then that guy has to make money off of it. Like, you need to be able to spend, like, 20% of your time, 30% of your time improving the software, and the other 60% of the time, you should be going out and helping people use your software and getting paid for doing that. And, and if you've got a great piece of software that really helps people do something, you know, let's say it's a, it's a thing like TiVo and you give it away for free, you might create a competitor who takes your software and he does nothing with it, but it, except just sell it to other people and take business away from you. Well, then what you have to do is go, well, that guy doesn't ever s commit any code. So, he can't really change it. He doesn't really like know how to change it. So then you need to find customers who need it to be changed. And you can go in and say like, hey, I've got this great piece of software. You can just install it. It works. And I can see it almost does what you'd need, but you really need it to do this instead. And then it could save you a lot of money or make you a lot of money. And that customer would go, hey, and, hey that, that looks really good, you know. And if your competitor who just rips you off all the time, if he comes in and tries to bid on that, they're going to go, well, you know, they'll get your proposal and then, you know, say, well, what would you do to change it? And he won't know because he doesn't ever change it, right? So then maybe he tries to fork it, right? Like maybe he says, ah, I'll change it and I'll keep my part, my, I'll keep my version, I'll never share it with the community. Well, what's going to happen very quickly is he's going to drift away from the community. And all these other people are going to be sharing their changes with each other. And he's going to have to be constantly trying to graft his solution onto the community. So his code base is going to drift away. And like not, it's going to fall out of sync. And the community will just move past him. You know, because Apache, somebody could have forked Apache a, a million times. I mean, people have tried to like make a proprietary Apache that they add something to that's special. Apache's still here, and those programs are gone, you know? So, and it's also, part of it is about making the, a much bigger pie. Like, that if you can have a proprietary software and you have 100 customers, or you give it away and you have a million people start using it, but a 1,000 of them need your help, you know, it can be a bigger, even though you're taking, you're not getting all of it, the piece that you're still getting is a bigger piece than you had before. That's kind of, I mean, I do work on um, the Apache Open for Business. And it's funny because like, I, I call on jobs and I know my competitors and some, some of them were friends. We like, we'll go to a conference and go drink beers and you know, hang out. And even though it's like, I'm gonna take that job from you. They're like, we'll see, man. <laughs> you know, but it's, it can be fun to be competitors. Kind of drives you on, you know, you're like, I'm gonna beat him, I can do better. Any other questions? Anybody, free questions, free answers for free questions about free software. Ooh. I love answering questions because my talk is too short. I will speak slowly, okay? Uh, yesterday, I, I had a lunch a friend of mine here, and he said to me, uh, property uh, systems is much more, it's much more interesting uh, than open source because 
he really, they really guarantee uh, support and inside me he can, he can prove from the system, from the kernel system. And I, I was thinking about it. I don't have a lot of questions, a lot of answers for, to him. What did you mean? How many of you have ever heard of somebody getting their money back from Microsoft because they didn't like Windows? Like, I mean, so I don't, proprietary software, if you, every time you o open a piece of proprietary software, you'll notice it's in an envelope that says basically like, this is, gar this is not guaranteed to do anything uh, or be fit for any purpose. Like every piece of commercial software, if you read the legal document, if you read the, le the legal document on the package when you open the package, it says it does not guarantee that that software will do anything. That the, even, what it's pro even what the package says that it will do, like if you read the contract on the document, it says the only thing that you are entitled to is your money back. So if you, if you buy a piece of software and you use it and it blows your business up, you know, you, you don't have any, all you can do is get a refund. I think you spend a lot of money with this kind of, uh, of business uh, contract, isn't I think developing software is expensive. It is. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, well, I want to thank all of you for sitting through my talk. Um, if you want, I could show you the Open Source for America site, like show you the back end if you want, because I wrote, I wrote it, so I could show you the front end of the side and the back end, so. Um, what time is, how, what time is my time up? 11? All right, we'll do a, I'll, I'll, I'll do a demo on site development for a little bit if you want. So let me get online. Ten minutes? Okay. I'm pretty much through the questions and everything. You might ask if anybody wants to ask a question in Portuguese. Right. We have, we have a really? Yeah. Uh, se alguém tiver, quiser fazer a pergunta em português que eu traduzo, eu posso traduzir também. de saber da, da sua parte é, eu gostaria de saber é, da sua parte o que você espera assim de desenvolvedores brasileiros contribuindo com um, um código de origem americana e sobre é, recentemente um, um caso que aconteceu com o SourceForce que eles fecharam o acesso a alguns países do eixo do mal é, você acredita que o software livre ele tem que ser livre independentemente de é, até estruturas políticas, liberdade de expressão, esse tipo de coisa? What? So Ian, what do you think about that? Yes, I, I think Apache is free software. Okay. So, 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 so the question is. Um, uh, first, he, he, he mentioned uh, when, when SourceForge kind of closed down uh, some countries, and if you think that uh, from, from, the, uh, from the evil countries, kind of from the U.S., the U.S. considered evil countries, uh, and if you think that free software should be uh, free to everyone, 
independent of political discussions and, and human rights and all of that, first thing. And the other thing that he asked me was, what do you expect from Brazilian developers in terms of contributing to um, you know, US-based or US-started open source projects? On the, yeah, but well, are you going to tell him in Portuguese? Oh, he understands English. Okay, great. <clears throat> well, the um, what was the question? Yeah, SourceForge, SourceForge in evil countries. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think the thing is, I I think that the United States, like China, if it wants to, can block people sending stuff to evil countries. It's just part of what a government does. Now, I think people in evil countries are also free to take a copy of the SourceForge code and start evil country SourceForge and have their own evil country SourceForge. I think that's perfectly reasonable. So that's, <laughs> that's um, and I, and it's, you know, whether sharing software, like dangerous software with your enemies, Maybe it promotes peace. I don't know. That's a complicated question. But I think, um, I think that we, the thing is, I think that free software is free because of law. Like, it's a copyright. And if you believe in the rule of law, which, you know, that's the United States and Brazil are based on the idea of the rule of law rather than a, a tyranny, that um, sometimes, you know, the law makes things crazy. But... You still have to obey it, you know? Só queria fazer um comentário a respeito da sua pergunta sobre os países do eixo do mal. É, enquanto eu estava na Sam, eu fui é, responsável, pra, por, eu liderei a comunidade do NetBeans, né? E fui responsável exatamente por, por é, discutir a relação do NetBeans com, inclusive com países, né? Tinha muita gente que desenvolvia isso no NetBeans, ou mesmo Eclipse, nos países que são barrados nos Estados Unidos. E aí, o pessoal reclamava, o pessoal falava, entrava em contato com a gente, dizia assim, olha, não consigo baixar o NetBeans porque o meu, o meu IP está bloqueado, porque eu, eu moro, sei lá, em algum dos vários países aí que os Estados Unidos bloqueiam. A Sam, como uma empresa americana, era obrigada a bloquear acesso a esses países, tá certo? E aí, o que a comunidade NetBeans fazia, que é perfeitamente razoável, é, por exemplo, tinha um cara no Panamá, tá certo? É, uh, o Aristides, né? É, que é um, um cara que ajuda a traduzir o NetBeans para espanhol, e ele baixava o código do fone do NetBeans e colocava numa página à disposição de todo mundo que quisesse, que não podia estar nos Estados Unidos, tá certo? Então, ele, tem, ele mora num país onde não tem restrição nenhuma e tem total direito de ter acesso ao código fonte e redistribuir o código fonte. Era então, exatamente o que ele fazia. Acho que a grande questão do software livre é essa. Você tem a liberdade de você fazer o que você quiser com o código, tá certo? até mesmo vai passar essas restrições se for o caso. Né? Se é, a Sam se importa ou não se importa, não é uma decisão da Sam. A Sam, como empresa americana, é obrigada a barrar, tá certo? Mas a, a comunidade de software livre arranjava uma forma de, de a dar o acesso a, ao código para quem precisava. Entendeu? Um, yes. So, and then with contributions from Brazilians to open source um, software and on primarily, I guess, English speaking projects, I guess we kind of expect you to speak English, but, you know, I think probably Lua should expect people to speak Portuguese, I guess, to be fair. So, and, um, you know, Lua is an awesome project and that's Brazilian, so. Um, I think that's the main thing. Is that what you're asking? You know, I guess do, write great code would be the other thing. Uh, I want to know what do you think uh, in the both 
of Sun Microsystem by Oracle. It can be bad for the open source community because we know that Sun was a greater supporter of the open source community with a lot of awesome products like Java and OpenSolaris, NetBeans. I, I think that we are about to find out just how big the Java open source community really is. I think we're, that's what we're going to find out. I don't, I don't have a clear picture because Sun, Sun made that picture confusing because they put so much money into those projects, it's hard to tell if those projects are happening on their own. I, I think, because I like Java, I'm going to continue to hack on Java no matter what Oracle does. And there's good GPL versions of Java that I'm going to use regardless of what Oracle does. So I guess Oracle needs to figure out how many guys there are like me and figure out if, he, if they want them on their side or on the other side. <laughs> I think that Oracle is probably smart enough to treat Java developers right, I think. So I don't, I don't think it's over. I think now Sun developers working for Oracle, I don't know if they're going to get treated right. Any, com any comment, Mr. Susan? OK, my, my comment, so just so you hear it, I'll do in English. My comment is that I'm very, very happy that we worked hard for many years, including me and Ian and a lot of other people, we worked hard for many years to open source Java, and we did this two years ago. So it's not something that's happening right now. It's been done two years ago. So we, we spent the last two years building the Java open source community around OpenJDK and around uh, you know, all of the iced tea and, and, and cafe and glass bath and all of those other projects. So I think that now, whatever happens, we are in a very good shape. I think we are um, you know, ready to rock this, you know. So and as Ian said, if, if, if the, the community is in good shape right now, it would be completely stupid from Oracle to ignore that. Is there even another speaker? What? Yeah. You. Oh, I'm the next speaker. Yeah. Pessoal, dado que o, a gente vai ter um painel na sequência sobre modelos de negócio software livre, e o Ian é um dos palestrantes, tá certo? Então, tem cinco minutinhos aí para começar o próximo painel. Vamos dar um tempinho aqui. Se quiser fazer as perguntas de open source, pode voltar aqui, que o Ian vai estar aqui também no, no próximo painel, tá certo? Assim como vai estar o Marcelo. Marcelo, se levanta aí, por favor. O Marcelo da Forlino vai participar do painel. Vai participar eu, vai participar o Ian. Né? É, o Simon Phipps também disse que viria. Tá certo? A gente vai... Bem, como a gente fez ontem, uma discussão aberta. Não... A ideia não é muito ter palestrante e, e, e assistentes. Não. Todo mundo participando da conversa sobre modelo de negócio. Então, em cinco minutinhos, a gente começa aqui. Tá bom? Valeu. Obrigado.